One of my favorite movies ever, and one of the greatest war movies ever, in my opinion, it's Terrence Malick's The Thin Red Line. Let me tell you why this movie is great, how to think about it, how to watch it, a variety of ways to get into the movie, coming up in this video. Terrence Malick's The Thin Red Line is a meditative philosophical war movie, a little bit different, or maybe quite a bit different than standard Hollywood war movies, yet it is interacting and dialoguing with some of the main ones that people know very well. In fact, this movie came out in the same year, coincidentally, as Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan, and while there are some similarities, Saving Private Ryan is the European theater, it's photorealistic, and it's patriotic. But The Thin Red Line is deliberately philosophical, asking gigantic questions that I find pretty interesting and thought-provoking. I think they can be life-changing. Why is there evil? Why is there evil in nature? What is evil? Why do we die? Where do we go when we die? All these kinds of massive questions, including why is there war? Why do humans go to war with each other? Good questions. This one focuses on the Battle of Guadalcanal in World War II in the Pacific Theater. Now the movie's origin I think is pretty interesting. This shows you how Terrence Malick works, or has worked in the past at least. This comes from a Pulitzer Prize winning novel by James Jones in the early 1960s of the same name, The Thin Red Line. Quickly it was made into a movie, which you can find on YouTube for free, The Thin Red Line from 1964. Both of these movies are interesting. They're cynical. They're sort of Vietnam era, even though they're right before the Vietnam War, but they fit in with that era pretty well. Cynicism about war, why we fight war for nation states and so on. And yet Malik takes all that material and completely reworks it, even though he lifted whole scenes of dialogue from that 1964 Thin Red Line movie, you'll see him do completely different things with it in this particular movie. I also find the movie is a mashup of historical battles, even though it says it's Guadalcanal, there's a number of different Pacific theater battles that this could allude to. Maybe it's bringing a number of them together. Uh, one example is when the men land on the island, the American soldiers, as they're sort of, sort of attacking the island, they expect a battle on the beach. But when they get to the beach, they find no one. Well, that's the Battle of Okinawa, if you know your military history. So the Battle of Guadalcanal is sort of not here in, or here in parts and other battles are here too. Now this movie does a number of strange things that I think need to be called attention to. And you know, Terrence Malick was quite well regarded at this time, even though he took all 20 years off of filmmaking, he made two movies, including The Great Days of Heaven from 1978, and then he took 20 years off and then came back and made movies. Well, all the major Hollywood stars, a number of male major Hollywood stars, came to him or were willing to participate in this project and you see them in this movie. But one giant question is, why do so many of them get cameos, these major Hollywood stars, while basically relative no-names are given major parts? If you look at the cast list, for example, Jim Caviezel, Ben Chaplin, they have major parts. Not neither of them were known at this time, even though Jim Caviezel becomes sort of a star after this, at least he played Jesus Christ in The Passion of the Christ, but at the time no one knew who he was. There are a number of other actors who are featured throughout, and you didn't know in 1998 who they were, but you watch this movie and you see, oh, George Clooney has two minutes in it. John Travolta has two minutes. John Cusick has five to ten minutes in this, a minor speaking part. Woody Harrelson has five to ten minutes of a speaking part. Why did they get only bit parts while the small-time actors get big parts? Interesting question. I think Malik is emphasizing, on the, for one thing, that the importance and extraordinariness of the ordinary soldier, the little guy, the no-name, the anonymous, through his choices of actors. I think that's pretty important to him. This is something I think would be modeled and emphasized in a later things like HBO's Band of Brothers, for example. I should mention as well, Adrian Brody has a turn in this as a nearly silent character. He wasn't known at the time either. He becomes more well-known after this movie. Now, supposedly Malik found the movie that you see in the editing room. He shot dozens of hours of footage and then went to the editing room after that and sort of discovered the movie and discovered a different movie than what he thought it was going to be. And I think his screenplay was much larger than what this movie ends up being. One of the major storylines, perhaps the major storyline in the movie, follows Private Wit, played by Jim Caviezel. I wondered how it would be when I died. Would it be like to know that this breath now was the last one you was ever going to draw? 
This is probably the easiest way to get into the movie is to follow his storyline, which goes from creation and paradise. He's actually a wall as a World War II soldier on a semi-utopian island in the Pacific where he's hobnobbing and cavorting with natives who are singing Christian hymns, swimming in the ocean, and they, they say in this movie that this island, they have no fights. This is kind of a paradisical place. Pretty quickly into the movie, he's captured and thrown into a black dungeon, which is the bowels of a ship that's going to take him to battle, and he's disciplined there for going AWOL. This is sort of the creation and then fall as it were the fall of this particular character but you see i think in this movie uh, malik's christianity shines through a biblical narrative placed onto this movie creation in the early chapters of genesis the fall of humanity into despair sin and decay and then a redemption which i won't spoil the movie but you'll see private wit involved in redemption and a restoration uh, which supposedly is the the story or the, one of the main storylines of the whole Bible itself. Now, Private Wit has an antagonist, also a friend in Sergeant Welsh, played by Sean Penn. Here, he was a major actor at this time, and along with Nick Nolte, he's one of two major stars in the movie. And these two form an interesting pair who have a series of conversations peppered throughout the movie about the meaning of life itself, philosophy of war, why we fight and so on and you see in this movie the cynicism embodied by sergeant welsh who wants to be numb towards losses in battle the death of men he hates war it seems like and he is deeply cynical about the reasons for a war at one time he called or one point he says that world war ii is about property people trying to own property dominate property you understand property Things about property. Sergeant Welsh also tells Private Wit that there is no other world besides this world. That is the material world, the earth itself. Whereas Private Wit begins to believe pretty early in the movie that there is an afterlife, that there's a life after death, that this life that he lives is a transition into the afterlife. And so you have this sort of worldview battle between the two or this contest of visions or insights into what life is all about between the two nevertheless they seem to be wannabe friends at times in this world a man himself is nothing and there ain't no world but this one you're wrong there top i've seen another world this pair, Private Wit and Sergeant Welsh, are mirrored in another pair featured in the movie. You could call it the other main storyline of particular characters, which is Lieutenant Colonel Tall and uh, Captain Staros. These two also are similar in that there's a cynicism and a desperation to win the war on the part of the seemingly crazed Private Tall. He's very aggressive and angry at times about winning and doing what's right and sacrificing men. Whereas Captain Staros wants to protect his men, not sacrifice him, and be a father. This movie shows two different kinds of fathers here, in fact. And that word is used later in the movie by the George Clooney character that the army is a, a, a family. There's a father and a mother and then the kids, which are the privates and the ordinary soldiers. The father here for Nick Nolte, who seems to know Greek and understands war, warrior culture, and interestingly, he believes that nature is cruel. That if you look around, you'll see parasites and organisms trying to dominate other organisms, which is then placed onto the war itself, where winning the war is all important. He's also about showiness, medals, giving honor to other people, like some kind of show where you can, you know, do have bravery in war and show your medals on your chest and show off your prowess, your courage, your honor, and so on. Are you prepared to sacrifice the lives of any of your men in this campaign? How many? One, two, 20? Lives will be lost in your company, Captain. And if you don't have the stomach for it, now is the time to let me know. Contrasted with that is Captain Staros, who risks everything in one of those classic movie storylines, military storylines, where the underling or the subordinate disobeys his superior and you have a conflict about who's right morally and ethically. 
I să se sapă licaria mu. Mă zamin, sir. It means you've been like my sons. Captain Staros then is the kind father watching out for his kids, where Nick Nolte, Colonel Tall, is the harsh, cruel, authoritarian father. And so you have the question of who's right, which is preferred, which is correct in this particular world, in this particular moment during the war. Look at those vines, the way they twine around the trees, swallowing everything. Nature's cruel, Staros. Now, having said all, all that, this movie is about the nature of nature itself. So bear with me here for a minute. The movie is, in one sense, about why there is war, murder, parasites, disease, decay in nature. The first shots of the movie and the first voiceover things that we hear are about that in particular. That means that what humans are doing in the war is not any different from what the vines do as they twirl around the trees or what the predators like the crocodile do as they submerge themselves and come up and hunt for other creatures causing pain and suffering and death. What's this war in the heart of nature? Why does nature vie with itself? Movie asks, why is there death in nature? and What can humans do about it? What should humans even think about it? Especially underlings or ordinary guys in war, of which you see a number of different reactions to this, including going crazy or insane is one answer. Um, thinking about memories about your love, your lover back home and dreaming about her is another answer. And then private wit, thinking about the afterlife and what his life means and what it means to go into the afterlife possibly is another one. There's a number of different ways or stances that a person could take in this war scenario where war itself is a microcosm of nature itself. You have those questions about death and suffering in nature, but then you have the other direction, which is that humans cause death and suffering in the environment. And humans are the ones who are destroying environments. One example is there's a lush, paradisical nature to all the islands the humans at war come to them and they devastate the environment and you see that particularly with colonel tall who is wildly triumphant whenever he wins a battle and then you see all the landscape around him decimated destroyed uh, barren it's a desert-like scenario and i think colonel tall is associated with the lack of water Water being the substance that gives life to all organisms, almost all organisms, and he is the one who can't get water to his soldiers, and he tells them, well, he tells his colonels and his officers, who cares if the men pass out, who cares if they don't have water? Well, the contrast with that is Private Wit, who is associated with water throughout this movie, including the, the glorious scenes of him swimming in water, which in one part is the paradisical island, and the other part is maybe the, the, the sign or symbol of what the afterlife looks like. Malik typically show, likes underwater swimming shots to show you glimpses of what the afterlife or transcendental stuff is. And the movie ends up being how humans disguise themselves, how actually predators disguise themselves in nature, look like nice, shiny, or glorious looking beautiful things, but then emerge out of those beautiful things to strike terror into the hearts of their prey. One of the signs of this is, you know, the crocodile submerging itself in the first shot. Well, the humans submerge themselves in the beautiful grass on the hill, whether it's Japanese or the Americans, in order to come up out of that beautiful substance and then kill or cause death and suffering. An interesting line in the movie, and it's one of those hard ones, is about birds. One man looks at a dying bird and thinks there's nothing but unanswered pain. The death's got the final word. It's laughing at him. Another man sees that same bird. Feels the glory. Birds are killed, and you see a dying bird. What do you think of? Do you think death is the tyrant laughing at you? It's the thing that dominates you. It is the thing that has control over all of nature. Or the other side of the question is, do you see glory in a dying bird? Well, I think the two sides of this question have to do with Private Wit's point of view. Seeing glory somehow in death, or seeing death being defeated somehow. Whereas the other man, like Sergeant Welsh, only see death 
and only this world and the nature that is at war with itself and humans that are destroying nature and at war with themselves in this world. I should go back to how this movie then is about other movies. It is quoting all kinds of war movies. One example is Malik casting John Savage in the military operations here in the movie. Now, Savage had played a major role in The Deer Hunter from 20 years before, which is about men going crazy or a couple of men going crazy during the Vietnam War, which is one reaction to realizing that nature and death and evil and destruction are dominant forces or the perception that they are. And so you see this character, the same actor playing a similar kind of character going crazy during the war, saying all we are is grass. He actually has an ecclesiastical view in terms of the books of Ecclesiastes and what he says about humans being dirt and all we are is grass. That's us. That's us. Another movie quote, I think this movie is really using and talking to the bridge on the River Kwai. Very famous movie because it's World War II prison camp movie and it ends with a commentary on the war or one of the commentaries on war which is that it's madness. 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 Humans killing other humans is madness, and what else can you do about it but say it's madness? That movie, A Bridge on the River of Kwai, opens with buzzards circling over the prison camp, and you see them up in the sky, ready to go down and eat the carry-on, which is the dead something, whether dead animals or dead humans, on a battlefield. Now you see those buzzards, the sort of birds, up in the air, quoted in this movie as well as a sign and signal that something nasty or terrible could happen. The buzzards are well aware of the death that's about to ensue. Question this movie then asks is, is death and destruction all that there is? Is everything going to decay? Is entropy a dominant force in the universe? Is nature just at war with itself? And Colonel Tall is right to go be the dominant one. And or Welsh is right in being the cynical one about this being the only world and everything's out to capture property and be the dominant force on its particular piece of property. I think the movie sides with private wit, at least given the arc of the movie, his highlight in the movie of, of his journey, as it were. Malik loves Pilgrim's Progress sorts of stories. Later, he would do a Pilgrim's Progress movie overtly, The Knight of Cups. Here, I think Private Wit is kind of a pilgrim wandering, journeying through the movie. And that's one reason I see him as the main storyline, even though there are probably three or four other major to uh, relatively major minor storylines. So one way to just watch this movie is with uh, Private Wit in mind in his Pilgrim's Progress journey from beginning to end to see that as the way to combat or overcome some of the cynicism, the dark cynicism in the movie, which comes from the James Jones novel, the original film, and a number of other war movies which tend towards cynicism or nihilism, because after all, what else is there besides war, death, and destruction as dominant forces in nature? Now, there are a thousand other things to say about this movie. I've seen it over 15 times, and I've looked at it very carefully, so I could do about 10 other videos on this. I'm curious, though, what you have to say about what I said in this video, what you think about this movie. Did it strike you or not? I've seen it so many times and enjoyed it so many times. I've gotten so much out of it that I could probably do a dozen other videos on this. Let us know in the comments what you think. Please subscribe to this channel for more great content. Thank you. Have a great day. They want you dead. Or in their life. Only one thing a man can do. Find something that's his. Make an island for himself. If I never meet you in this life, let me feel the lack. <laughs>